Hey there, everybody. It's Karen Ricks, head chef of our kitchen classroom. And I am so excited to be able to just pop on here and uh, share these unbelievable stories of my family's wild and wonderful global culinary adventures over the last decade plus. <laughs> Um, so back at the very beginning of July, I put out this um, brief blurb just about who I am and what I like to do and how I got started on this crazy adventure of a life <laughs> that my family and I now lead as nomadic world schoolers and so many of you reached out with some amazing questions. Uh, so I wanted to be able to pop in here on occasion and just address some of those key questions that you have been asking about our journeys, whether it's the travel, whether it's the homeschooling, unschooling, world schooling, <laughs> whether it's the work that we're doing on the road, um, so many different aspects to this life that we lead that many of you are expressing curiosity about. And I want to be able to address a lot of those questions here in the month of July. <laughs> oh, this is just a little bit of ice water here on a hot Albanian evening <laughs> this summer. What are you drinking? Go ahead and drop me a note in the comments and let me know what sort of cool and refreshing beverages really light you up on those hot summer nights. <laughs> I actually still have sticky fingers. I was just recording a little video about watermelon, which is one of those wonderful things that we have been playing with here in an attempt to stay cool and to stay hydrated and of course to play with our food. <laughs> and playing with food is one of the ways that we are really not only encouraged, but inspired and really motivated to dive in to the new language, the new uh, culinary history and traditions and cultures as we travel around the world. And as many of you know from reading our story or knowing a little bit of my background, back in 2007, my husband and I kind of left our lives in the United States, picked up and moved to Japan. And I really truly thought that my husband had lost his mind when he even suggested that because we didn't know anybody who had done it anything like that at that point in our lives. We didn't know any Japanese. I mean, we didn't speak Japanese. We didn't read or write Japanese. We didn't understand the Japanese language. And so when I did actually pick up and move to a completely new country, sight unseen, it was a real shock to me as a literate individual to suddenly find myself functionally illiterate. And I mean, <laughs> think about this for a minute. Okay, here I was in my 30s. I had been reading and writing and expressing myself really clearly in more than one language since I was a small child. <laughs> but Japanese was not one of those languages. And so when I landed in Japan, with a few basic greetings and phrases under my belt, but really nothing more. I was in shock. And so one of the things that I decided to do was go shopping. I mean, after all, you've got to eat, right? And so when my husband was off at work teaching, I would take some time and venture out to the local supermarket and I would literally just wander up and down the aisles. Now, at this point, like literally just a couple of weeks into my stay in central Japan, I knew enough 
basic Japanese to be able to ask something like, where is, insert whatever here, <laughs> but I didn't know enough to be able to understand someone's directions if they were to point me uh, straight ahead, right, left, aisle five, didn't know those things. So I had a lot of very helpful staff members in our local markets who would walk me up and down the aisles and help me find some of the basic things that I was looking for. But one of the things that I was not prepared for was just to be faced with this wide array of products on market shelves that I had absolutely no idea what they were. And so I began this little game of experimentation and I would grab a random item off the shelf. I would, you know, examine it, look and see, you know, maybe what else was around it, what it kind of looked like that I may have been familiar with in my experience. And I would buy it and take it home and open it up and smell it and feel it and, you know, shake it around and listen to it. And then I would taste. And I still did not know enough Japanese at that point to be able to look up what something was. If you're not familiar with the Japanese language, it actually uses three different syllabary. It's like, it's not even like learning one new alphabet or two new alphabets because two of them are rather phonetic and uh, function like alphabets. But the third syllabary is what's known as uh, kanji or the Chinese pictorial characters. And so there's a special technique for using a dictionary to look those things up. And a couple weeks into my stay in Japan, I had no idea how to do that. And actually, I don't think I even had a Japanese English dictionary at that point. And so I really just began playing with random stuff that I picked up at the market. And it was in times like that, that uh, I discovered all sorts of different teas and the complete and utter shock to my taste buds at grabbing a bottle of green tea and taking a sip and discovering that that was not sweetened after having come from the South in the United States where sweet tea is all you will find. Well, let me say that that was absolutely a shock to my palate. <laughs> Have you ever had a shock like that? <laughs> maybe you were traveling, maybe you were just um, visiting a brand new eating establishment for the first time and you get something and you think you know what it is and you taste it and it's completely different from what you expected. <laughs> well, that's what it was like for me the first time I tasted Ryokucha, Japanese green tea that was unsweetened. It was definitely a shock to my system. I will never forget that. <laughs> but another discovery I had that was also related to beverages was as I was walking through the refrigerated section and I saw cartons of milk. And I couldn't read the cartons, but they were pretty easily identifiable uh, as white cartons with pictures of cows on them. And some of them had pictures of like little children drinking or something. Although I later learned that not all of those were actually milk. <laughs> now what I did, of course, was what we all do when faced with an interesting situation was I made some assumptions. So I saw the white cartons with the cows and I was like, okay, milk. And I saw some other pink cartons nearby that had pictures of strawberries on it. I was like, oh, strawberry milk. And then I saw a brown carton nearby and I was like, ooh, chocolate milk, yay. And I was so excited. So that was one of my purchases. And I picked up this carton and I took it to the register, paid for my groceries and took it home. <laughs> and this was one of those instances where I was so glad that I was able to share this experience with my husband because just like normal, I took it home, shook it up and listened to it. Yep, that's definitely liquid and opened it up and took a peek and I was like, oh yeah, that's brown. <laughs> Pour some out and take a sniff. Hmm, it doesn't exactly smell like chocolate. <laughs> So for those of you who don't know, I am not a coffee drinker. I don't like the taste of coffee, but I passed this to my husband and I said, I think this smells like, and he smelled and he took a sip 
And that brown carton that I found next to the white carton and the pink carton in the milk aisle was not chocolate milk at all, but it was coffee flavored milk. <laughs> and this is a hugely popular beverage in Japan. It's something that even children drink, but it was definitely not something that I wanted to drink. And so not only did I learn to challenge my assumptions about what to find in general areas of the supermarket when I'm in a country that is new to me, but I also learned how to read my first two katakana characters, which is one of the two alphabetic syllabary in Japanese, and that was kohi, which means coffee. So I will never ever forget that particular experience learning a little bit about reading, <laughs> learning to challenge my assumptions, and continuing to learn and explore as I was playing with food, having just moved from the United States to Japan 13 years ago. <laughs> now, I've since learned how to read and write and speak and understand a lot more Japanese <laughs> and in the coming week I want to be able to tell you more stories from those early days and maybe even introduce you to some of the amazing people that I had the privilege of getting to know during my time in Japan that helped make that experience so incredibly magical. <laughs> But as always, we're going to continue to play with our food. And so I want to invite you to join us over in our Play With Your Food community. We're not going to be making any kohi miruku, no coffee flavored milk, but maybe we'll make some chocolate milk. <laughs> and as I said at the beginning of this video, we are definitely playing with watermelon. So you'll learn some cool new stuff. You can check out the latest video over on my YouTube channel where we are teaching you some really fun and delicious techniques for slicing up your watermelon as a cool and refreshing treat this summer. <laughs> From our kitchen classroom here in Tirana, Albania, to yours, wherever you are in the world, please, by all means, keep sharing your questions with me. I look forward to answering them and telling even more stories from 13 years living outside the United States, uh, from here in Albania right now, and from all over this beautiful blue ball that we have had the privilege of enjoying and experiencing in the last 13 years. I will see you tomorrow. <laughs> Take care.